we have heard our talk now, and it's about complexity. And, and I like that. I, I don't know if that was planned, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about is how we simplify this complexity and we understand it. And because I'm interested in economic development. And if we're interested in economic development, one of the things that we want to understand is something that is really complex, which is actually the world, and why there are some countries that are doing better than others, and why other ones that are not doing so good. So the thing is, if we're going to start even talking about this, we need to at least agree on some way of describing it. And if I think something as complex as the world, and I say I want to have like a simple description, I'm probably going to end up saying something that you know, if I want to put it in a single word, I want to say that the world is probably diverse. That would be a single word that would not be so bad to describe the world. But the thing is, a lot of this diversity also, we notice that it's man-made. And the problem here is that this diversity is not evenly distributed among the world. So that's a little bit of the problem that we have in hand. It's not a problem of countries being rich and countries being poor. It's a problem of countries being not equally diverse. There's not the same amount of markets operating in each one of these countries. So, and, and this is a problem because the traditional theories that we have are not theories of diversity, are theories of the aggregate levels of demand. So there are theories in which exporting a lot of oil and buying all imports with the money that you get from oil it's equivalent of having a very diverse practice structure in where there's people that can do a lot of different things and can specialize and, and can do all these different intricate products and they have the know-how to do so. And this is, this is the traditional way that we have been thinking about it and I call this these putty models or putty theories and I'll, I'll explain you why. Because we do not disagree on the fact that the world actually is, is complex and we know that in order to produce any output, you know, we have to get people, and these people have to interact with different forms of capital, being this like a cement mixer, or like a forklift, a shovel, a telephone, and as people interact and they form networks with the different products, they produce other products, and they could be, you know, exporting apples, or they would be creating cars and whatnot. So we know that this complexity exists, but the way that we have been thinking, the traditional macroeconomic theory has been thinking about it is, well, you know, actually all this labor we can compress it into one variable that we say like the amount of people and then all this capital is another variable because you know if like you have a telephone and the telephone costs you like 20 bucks well you know how many telephones do I get to buy a laptop that is a hundred you know a uh, thousand bucks you know and you can do the conversion because you have the prices so you can aggregate all these things so although we know that there's a lot of complexity you basically what you take is like two lumps of putty one putty that is labor another lump of capital and the process of production it's basically something like this. <laughs> yeah. okay. So this is the way that we have been thinking about the world, and we have been abstracting it. So, well, we said like when, we, when we're doing models, when we're doing theory, we always say we have to keep it simple because the world is too complex. Our head is like one and a half kilos of gray matter, so like, let's, let's keep it simple. Let, let's stick to the party models, but are there problems with the party models? And I say, well, there are because in party models, if you ask the question, like, does diversity matter? Well, it doesn't, because as long as it adds up to the same amount of party, it's all the same. The, how do economies grow in this party world? Well, by saving party. You know? So countries that are poor, they need to save. And does it matter where they're getting that party from? It cannot. You know? Because the party that you save from exporting cars is equivalent to the party that you get from exporting vehicles. So it doesn't matter. All is party. You know? Money is money. A dollar is a dollar, no matter where you're getting it from. And during the last couple of years, together with Ricardo Hausmann, we have been thinking that actually there's an alternative way in which we can do a theory not of an aggregate level of demand and a theory of diversity. And I'm going to present a few basic principles, and based on those basic principles, I'm going to show some metalized facts that hopefully I'm going to show you that there is an alternative way of thinking. And this is super simple. Actually, when I look at this principle, I say, are you going to be able to deduce anything of something that simple? But actually, I'm, I'm surprised after four years, yeah, we have been able to do some stuff. So the first one is a product is a combination of a lot of different things. We're not going to say that it's like two types of party. It's like a combination of many different Lego pieces. 
Okay? So it's a very intricate thing, and these Lego pieces could be regulations, could be forms of capital, could be capabilities that exist within an organization, could be norms. Do workers show up in time? Do they get you know, drunk before coming to work, or are they responsible? So it could be like the most bizarre things that you, that you think about, but there are many of them. And countries have some of them, and not others. And we're going to say, well, a country can make things if it has all that it takes. So the one question that you can say, okay, Okay, so sure, you know, that, that sounds reasonable, but which country has more capabilities? Which country has less capabilities? Which one has more of these Lego pieces? And actually, I'm going to show you now how you can count them, because it's possible to count them. So I didn't tell you what they are, but I'm telling you that instead of having this Y equals FKL that we had before, now we have a country, and a country has a bunch of Lego pieces, and products require Lego pieces. And a country makes a product if it has all that it takes. So, would it be possible to infer from the structure of this network some property of the other network, the one that connects countries to capabilities to products? And it's very simple. The first thing that you have to consider is, well, if a country has a lot, a lot, a lot of Lego pieces, okay, it has what it takes to make a larger diversity of products. So the diversity in the number of products that you make should be related to the diversity in the number of capabilities that you have. If you have few Lego pieces, you're missing a lot of pieces to produce a lot of things. So you're going to be able to produce a fewer diversity of things. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is that you could have two countries that make exactly the same number of products, and one of them is making products that require lots of Lego pieces, like the Millennium Falcon. So the Millennium Falcon up there, very complicated product, you know, very complex, lots of pieces. You know? So you need to take this into account. If you just count the number of products and you don't count how many pieces these products require, you don't have a clue which country has more pieces. So what you can do is, well, you can see that this problem is symmetric because I have a network that connected countries to products. So what if I look on the product side and I look at how many countries make that product or the ubiquity of a product? So if a product requires very few pieces, it's going to be very ubiquitous. Every country has the pieces that you need. If a product requires lots of pieces, it cannot be very ubiquitous because there are few countries that have all those pieces. So a little bit of what we did to count this is you can start actually weaving these measures of diversity and ubiquity. You know, so I have on one side here like with, with a bit of like a more diagrammatic thing. On the other side, there are like some formulas for the visualization impaired. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the idea is basically now, if you're a diverse country, I have sort of a clue that you have lots of capabilities. But now if you're a diverse country, make products that few countries make, and those countries that make the things that you do are also very diversified, then I have a better guess. And every time I incorporate more of this information on diversification and ubiquity, I have a better and better guess. So this is how you can count the relative number of capabilities that countries have. So now that we have an idea of how to measure things with Legos, let's compare with PuTTY. So this is a comparison between PuTTY and Legos. So in the y-axis, you have PuTTY, and we know how to measure PuTTY. It's GDP per capita adjusted by purchasing power parity. So it's kind of like the amount of money that flow over an entire economy divided by the number of people in that economy. And on the x-axis, I have you know, the relative number of parties that it has, measured you know, as in a standard deviations from the mean. And so this is after I consider diversification and ubiquity like four times. You have a four there. And what I see here is there's like a pretty good correlation. Yeah? So countries that I say they have more capabilities tend to be richer. Okay. And you see Pakistan, Chile, and Singapore there as an example because Pakistan, Chile, and Singapore are three countries that if you count the number of products, make export exactly the same number of products. But when you consider the ubiquity of those products, when you consider the diversification of countries that also make those products, Singapore kind of moves to the side of the rich countries and groups with them, and Pakistan moves to the side of the not-so-rich countries and groups with them. But now the question is, well, who is wrong, you know? Because that, at least in this view, they're sort of telling us the same. But the question is, who is adjusting to whom? So if income is determined by the number of capabilities that you have, the countries that are below that line should grow fast. Yeah? Because you have what it takes to make lots of products. Okay? So you can support lots of industries, and you can support higher wages. You can make sophisticated products that have a high division of labor. If you're above that line, you should grow not so fast because you have a lot of income, but you don't know how to do a lot of things. So it's not very sustainable. So this is what we find, actually. So we find that countries' income, or economic growth, 
is related to the complexity of their economies, the number of Lego pieces that they have. So if you have a lot of Lego pieces given your income, you grow faster. So China, Korea, Hong Kong, even Singapore in the 60s, that people say it was a basket case. No, it wasn't. It was a country that already had a productive structure that was pretty diversified and, and, and quite intricate. So then were countries that were like doomed to grow. So this is one of the things. So it's telling, well, you know, actually, like in, in, in this view, you know, Legos are determining the amount of putty that you can get. So it doesn't make sense too much to think about putty. It makes sense to think about these Legos and you can count them. But the question is, you know, now that we have disaggregated the thing and we're thinking about Lego pieces, is how do countries accumulate these Lego pieces? Because saving putty before it was very simple. You no know, matter what you do, you save putty and it's all the same and we're happy with that. You know, where countries should save. You know, that would be a, a bit of the advice. But now how do they accumulate the pieces? And well, it's not so trivial. So this is a, a, another body of research that we have been looking a little bit of, of how these countries accumulate. And we can think that we have like the network of countries and products that we looked before. And there's another implication from the three basic principles that I said. So if products require like a large combination of these ones and zeros, they require some Lego pieces and not others, couples of products are going to require similar sets, and there are some products that are going to require different sets. Yeah? There are going to be some products that are going to be more similar in their inputs. So I can say maybe, you know, men's shirts and women's shirts, maybe they're not so similar because the different cuts, the fashion changed, you know, more quickly for women than for men. But then if I compare men's shirts or women's shirts, with cars, you know, they require a very different set of inputs. But I don't know what those inputs are. So how can I say which products are similar? Well, I can do so because I know which countries make those products. So I can say, well, if the countries that export bananas are the same set of countries that export mangoes, I can make a guess, you know, an educated guess that probably bananas and mangoes require the same inputs. If those countries do not export motorcycles, probably they require different inputs. So I can build the product space. So I can take a projection of this network and project it into a space of products. And this is what I call the product space. So this is a picture of the product space in the year 2007. So each one of these little dots represents a product of the world economy. And here they're disaggregated into like around roughly 1,000 categories. So for example, the green dots that you see there, like a dot there would be something like, you know, men's shirts, women's shirts, overcoats. You know, things like that. And the size of the node would tell you the amount of trade that is there in the world. And the links, the red links and the blue links, will tell you, OK, these products tend to be co-produced very likely, co-exported by the same country. So these are products that actually, you know, probably require the same set of capabilities. And you see there that the product space has a structure that is not very trivial. You know, there's like a green cluster, and then there's like a central cluster. Then there are other peripheral clusters, like on the bottom, there's one that says electronics. And there's a lot of products on the periphery that are not very connected. For example, oil is like the big crimson dot up there, which is very big. It's 5% of world trade, but it's very peripheral. So if you do oil, there's nothing close by that, 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 you know, that would require the same type of input. So we think of this product space as kind of like a forest, in which each one of these little nodes is like a tree. And a country is a set of private firms, or monkeys, that live <laughs> in the forest. <laughs> and that live from the fruits in the forest. Okay? So one question is, well, where are the monkeys? You know, are monkeys of different regions located in different parts? So here the black squares, I'm using the black squares to show the products that were exported by each one of these regions with comparative advantage. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But it's kind of like the products that these regions make substantially or significantly. And you see that industrialized countries have all these black squares, all the monkeys are located in the center. East Asia and Pacific has monkeys in the garments cluster, the textile cluster, the electronic cluster, and also somehow in the periphery. Latin America, Latin America and the Caribbean is almost exclusively on the periphery. And Sub-Saharan Africa is even way on the boondocks, you know, outside. So they're in very different places. So does it matter? And the last thing that I'm going to show you is, well, how do these monkeys jump? And for the sake of time, I'm going to show you with like a little example. So we have Malaysia in 1985. And the black squares are the products that they were good at making at that time. They were exporting. You see on the bottom on the electronic clusters, can you see in the electronic clusters, there's like a few black squares there. 
So look what happens if I'm going to go through time. So it's like a very rudimentary type of movie. I'm going to be clicking, and then I'm going to go to 1990. Look what happens in the cluster down there, 1995 and 2000. So you see that now Malaysia makes more products than before. It's more diversified. But this diversification was constrained by the structure of the product space. Yeah? If, if you missed it, yeah? so there we go, 1985. <laughs> so the monkeys are jumping to the trees that are close by. You know? We cannot explain that by saving putty. Because if they would be saving putty, they would have been able to jump anywhere. So the fact that the jumps are to the products that are close by tells us something. Tells us that what these countries are doing, what the entrepreneurs of these countries are doing, they're solving like a very, very hard, very complex coordination problem. If I have two products that require 20 capabilities, and for one of them, I have 10, and for the other one, I have none, which one am I going to be more easy to jump to? Probably the one that I already have 10, you know, because I need to accumulate 10 extra capabilities to be able to produce that. Okay? This also tells us that there is a trap that emerges. Okay? Because what happens is that now, think of a country that has like very, very few capabilities. Okay? So it has 10 capabilities. And the product that requires the less requires 20. What happens if that country accumulates five more capabilities? Does it get anywhere? And there's phone there. Yep. So <laughs> it doesn't get anywhere. Yeah? So it's going to get stuck. You know? A country, by the same token, that has lots of capabilities, it would accumulate one or two more, would already find everything else that is needed in its own productive structure to put that into productive use. So I want to end up with these two points. And, and just to have like a few more traditional closing remarks, like conclusion. So that economic development is not about more of the same. It's not about accumulating party. It's not about rich countries and poor countries. It's about the diversity. So when you look at a country, for example, like China, or you look at Taiwan 25 years ago, those are not poor countries. They're rich countries that the check is in the mail. Okay? And you can actually quantify that. So when we're talking about diversity, we're not giving like a normative statement. I'm not telling you diversity is beautiful. I'm not telling you exactly. I'm telling no, no, actually you can measure this. You can measure this and it predicts growth. Okay, so uh, this diversity appears to matter. Okay, but, but its development is not easy. It's very path dependent. You know, you jump to products that are close by in the product space, like trees, you know, and monkeys, you know, like that, like that story. So now what this opens is opens like a new Pandora's box of how do we think about industrial policy now? Okay? And if we're going to think about industrial policy, we have to think about a strategy that takes these type of things into account. If I'm a country, which are the products that are close to me? Okay? Are those products bringing me close to other products? Okay? Who are the firms that are participating in related activities? So you have this whole new dimension of strategy that opens up. And you can tailor now industrial policies to individual countries. So a bit like, I like thinking of the product space as a way that you would be taking like an X-ray of a country and you would be seeing exactly where it is and, and where it can go. So with that, I would like to leave and thank you very much for your time. Yeah.